Welcome to Catholic Economics. I'm your host, Levi Russell, and today is August 1st, 2020. So today I want to discuss Friedrich Hayek's Road to Serfdom, the, the concepts behind his book. Um, it's, it's a popular book. It was, it was a big deal uh, around the time Obama was elected, and it shot up to the top of the charts, even though it was a really old book. And the basic idea is that there's this slow road to essentially socialism, serfdom. I don't know why he uses the term serfdom, really, uh, except that libertarians equate that with socialism for some reason. So there's this slow road to socialism through the uh, kind of uh, small changes in property rights over time and this move away from the sort of liberal ideal. So I want to talk about that, and I want to give a, a perspective on, um, from, from sort of a right-wing perspective or, or a more Catholic perspective, a more anti-liberal perspective, that I think makes a little more sense. Um, but before that, uh, I have a sponsor for the show, uh, and, I, and I want to kind of just give you a little bit of information about them. So I often talk about buying local and supporting Catholic businesses, um, but I want to make you aware of a great business run by a young Catholic couple. Colette's Carvings makes beautiful wooden plaques for your home. I bought one of the first ones they made for my son's room. He's named after St. Francis Xavier, and Colette's Carvings did a great job making a custom wall hanging to honor his namesake. Their themes range from saints to custom family nursery signs to holiday decor, devotionals and decor for your, from our home to yours. Check out Colette's Carvings on Etsy at the link in the show notes. So the, the main thing that I wanted to talk about is this idea of the road to serfdom. And I'm, I'm just going to substitute the road to socialism in for, for uh, serfdom uh, because I think um, there's there it, it's, it's just a better term for what I think they actually, what, what Hayek actually means. Um, so the, the issue that Hayek is trying to get at is that there is this um, ever present danger that we will descend into socialism through the, uh, this move away from true freedom, which is liberal capitalism, right? So first of all, you've got to, we, we would have a problem, I think, saying that, um, you know, modern capitalism is true freedom, right? True freedom is, is, uh, is conforming your will to God's, right? Um, and so freedom isn't being able to do whatever you want. So there's, there's that, I think, fundamental difference on the front end. But then as we, as we kind of understand Hayek's uh, perspective here, what, what he's essentially saying is that, it's very important in a democratic system for the public to really understand uh, the importance of property rights, even if they don't see it as benefiting them uh, directly. They need to see that, well, it's okay for the sort of uh, the, the upper crust uh, owners of, of the bulk of the capital in the economy to 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 be able to have all of that capital because it's very efficient and it makes their their material lives better and because if they don't if those people don't understand that if, if the, the average person doesn't understand that then what's going to happen is they're going to vote in politicians who are going to um, change property rights in ways that uh, reduce the uh, ability of uh, large companies to have uh, uh, massive economies of scale, and that reduction in the productivity of the economy is going to make them f physically worse off uh, in terms of material po uh, prosperity, and they will descend into a, a miserable socialism where uh, they are um, increase, you know, this, this, the government putting the boot on the capitalist is also going to put a, put the boot on them and they're going to be poorer and et cetera, et cetera. And so this is the, the common thing you hear when, when you talk about policies that, uh, liberal types don't like, um, when you talk about curtailing property rights and stuff like that, um, from, from, again, from a practical perspective, uh, obviously, in Catholic social teaching, there's a lot of discussion about the importance of property rights, but there's also the notion that they are not absolutes. Uh, so there's the, the, the way Hayek thinks this should happen, right, is that you have these 
uh, intellectuals at the top who understand the importance of property rights and the importance of, of sort of the liberal uh, policy narrative, okay? And they're sort of always crafting that narrative and trying to make it better. And then you have what he calls secondhand dealers and ideas. And these secondhand dealers are the people who take the information from the high up intellectuals and they make it understandable for the man in the street, for the normal voter. Um, and this way, or if they're successful, then the normal voter understands that um, they need to make sure that uh, government policy is um, is is put in such a way that it's it's sort of consistent with free market liberal ideas. Um, and so we see this actually happen in in terms of its concrete. Uh, how, how does it actually affect policy? Well. We have these, uh, for instance, we have um, things like the Mercatus Center, these, all of these kind of pseudo intellectual academic think tanks uh, that work with policymakers directly. They work with um, they work with academics directly to try to kind of create this knowledge pipeline for the average person. And uh, they're also heavily involved in uh, trying to get their own people into the executive branch for, uh, you know, bureaucratic type positions and stuff like this. And, and that's a big win for them when they're able to do that. So the, um, th this, this narrative isn't just something in the book. Uh, it's, it's an important part, you know, it's, it's obviously the, 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 the main narrative in the book, but it's also an important part of the strategy of, uh, liberal types, uh, these days. So, it's interesting that in the book Hayek does mention that he thinks that the the some of the basic needs that the state should handle, for instance, uh, healthcare is the one he mentions that uh, that the state should at least you know find a way to finance this by some kind of sort of federal or or, or large uh, you know insurance scheme. So that would I think these days constitute a pretty significant. Uh, departure from what your average libertarian or your average kind of, you know, quote unquote, conservative liberal uh, would say about these types of policies. Uh, they would be more in line with uh, sort of the uh, Milton Friedman night watchman state, you know, that the government's there for police and fire and, um, you know, national defense and stuff like this. And that's really it, right? They're supposed to just let everything else uh, go. Um, and I think that the, the problem here, the reason, so when this, when this whole road to serfdom perspective comes out into, uh, policy debates is this is where we get to this concept of any time a distributist or someone who's very interested in Catholic social teaching comes out and says, Hey, you know, I think we should, um, modify property rights because we want to make sure that you know, the average person or the bottom 40% of income earners or whatever can uh, live a life of dignity. And this is where, you know, the liberals will come in and say, oh gosh, you know, you're a socialist and you just want socialism and you're going to, you're going to put us down the road to socialism, blah, blah, blah. That's where you get all these types of discussions. And what I think is interesting about this is that, um, you know, I'm very concerned personally about um, ending up in a left-wing socialist kind of um, per world, right? I don't, I don't want this to happen. I don't want us to end up in this left-wing world. But I think the libertarians have it completely wrong in terms of how we get there. I think the way we get there is the, the, the public loses its ties to pre-liberal institutions that are holding us together. So it's not that the free market and um, liberal property rights, uh, absolutism, and, and all of this kind of stuff. It's not that these things are holding society together and, and keeping us from falling uh, headlong into leftist socialism. The things that are keeping us from doing that are the, the pre-liberal institutions that still have some kind of a grip on society. So the, the importance and centrality of the family, uh, thinking about the family as the fundamental unit of society, not the individual. 
the uh, the ties that bind communities together, right? And this this includes things like, um, you know, you're, you've got your your town's high school football team, you know, and it's like, well, we you know we hate that other team down the road because you know they're a bunch of scumbags, and you know this is our team and and we're the best, right? Uh, it's this idea that there's um, you, you care more for your community and your own people. Right, the people that live near you or your extended family, right? You have more love for them than you do for people much farther away. Um, th- these are all pre-liberal types of things. They they were much more important before the so-called Enlightenment, and they they still exist to some extent. To the extent that the the liberal worldview has not destroyed them completely. Those are the things that are holding us together. Those are the things that are staving off a sort of left-wing takeover of um, our institutions. And to the extent that the liberals have success, to the extent that we have uh, free market capitalism and this free-for-all mentality that, you know, your community doesn't matter. You just move to wherever you want. Um, It doesn't matter if you're... Uh, you know, if you, if you're, if you are unable to find a job where you live, then you just need to leave. You just need to leave your, your, your ancestors graves behind and go strike out, uh, somewhere new where you don't know anyone, you have no support system, etc. Um, you should just be completely rootless and just follow the money, right? Um, this is the incentive structure. If not, you know, maybe it's not the explicit advice that, uh, say a Catholic capitalist will give you, but it's certainly the incentive structure that's built into the system that they want to exist. And the reality is that those are the types of policies. That is the system that's going to push us into this detached left-wing socialist system. Because when people have no roots, when people have no support system, when we have the problems we have with deaths of despair uh, and issues like this, that is when people are going to go to something that they feel is powerful enough and big enough to do what they need it to do, namely the state. Um, and and then we're going to get sort of the, the left-wing socialism. So I would certainly say that the state should do more than it does in certain areas. And uh, sometimes I think libertarians might have some good ideas about how to curtail certain things to make them make more sense. But I think the problem is that they aren't focused on the family as the fundamental unit of society. Right. Because if they'll tell you that, but then you poke them and, uh, you know, you suggest some kind of maybe pro natalist policy, right, a a policy that would... um, you know, ensure that the, you know, there's one parent at home with the kids or uh, you're explicitly giving subsidies to families that have children, right? Then, then all of a sudden they just, they sound like Milton Friedman or whatever. They're, they're all of a sudden, oh, there we go. Now I'm a liberal. Um, so you can tell um, that, that because their, their practical policy stuff always ends up being this kind of um, free market, anti-government perspective, um, that they're not willing to use the government as a, a tool to stave off this, um, this sort of left-wing socialist perspective. Um, and so I have a couple of quotes that I think do a really good job of kind of uh, pulling this all together and uh, just sort of coalescing the, 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 what I'm trying to get across today um, by people who are much uh, smarter than me in terms of <laughs> their ability to make these pithy statements. Uh, so the first one I want to give is by uh, Belloc. Um, And so Belloc says, quote, a society in which the mass of men have no experience of ownership is a society which sees in socialism the shortcut to its ideals, unquote. So I think what what's so great about that quote is it really coalesces this idea that if if we don't have policies that incentivize and create a structure for the average person to own the means of their own provision, right? Uh, then we're going to have a system that is going to devolve into a socialist system. 
I think this also puts a lie to the idea that Belloc was some kind of socialist. He was a Fabian. He was a whatever. Um, this is just it's, it's stupidity. Um, you know, obviously, this quote right here demonstrates that Belloc did not like socialism, and he he wanted the average person to have ownership in things, right? Ownership not only of your own home or or you know things like that, but to be able to have an ownership and the productivity that gives the, the, the that gives you the ability to provide materially for your family. Um, so the other quote I wanted to give you is from uh, Pope Pius XI. And so he says, quote, If we would explain the blind acceptance of communism by so many thousands of workmen, we must remember that the way had been already prepared for it by the religious and moral destitution in which wage earners had been left by liberal economics, unquote. So he's, what he's saying here is that the reason why we see communism happening uh, in his time, right, 100 years ago or so, the reason why we saw that uh, blossoming and, and building such institutional power and the reason we, that we saw uh, the average laborer in favor of it is because they had the, the, the liberal system had already broken down all of these other, uh, you know, again, pre-liberal types of institutions that kind of gave the average person some community, gave them support, gave them some kind of social structure and taught them the importance of things like family, faith, uh, and, and um, you know, the, the importance of their own provision for, their, for themselves, right, instead of just going to the state. Well, when you've ripped all these other things away from them, when you've ripped family and society away from them, um, and they feel vulnerable, they're going to look for something for look to something else for strength. Um, and, and there are certain ways in which, you know, the state uh, is is strength, it has strength and, and has legitimate authority. I mean, the Bible tells us this Romans is very clear in Romans, uh, that the state has legitimate authority. Um, but obviously, we don't want to see that go down the road of uh, communism and, and uh, sort of left wing statism, we, we don't want to see that. So the best way to stave that off is to, um, is to promote policies that will give us uh, uh, the environment that we can live in with authentic community uh, and, and, uh, and, and it promotes the family. So with that, I, I appreciate your time. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you'd like to chip in for the podcast, there's uh, a link in most of the podcast apps. There's also links in the description for Subscribe Star and Patreon. Thanks for your time and have a good day. As you know, we could use more voices on the traditionalist right. And one of the best ways to do that is with the podcast. I've been using Anchor.fm for this podcast and for another podcast for over a year. And I've really enjoyed it. It's free and it allows me to upload clips and also to record and edit. It also disperses all of my podcasts to all the major platforms, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It also allows me to monetize and to collect donations. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. If you want to join me in being a voice for the traditionalist right, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. (laughs) 